At midnight on January 17, 1920, the manufacture, sale, and transportation of intoxicating liquors became illegal across the United States. During those dry and trying years of prohibition, how did Angelinos keep their glasses half full? The Volstead Act might have outlawed alcohol, but it couldn't make it disappear. The truth is, clever Angelinos found ways to keep the liquor flowing. Some made their own. Others sold legal, medicinal whiskey, prescribed by obliging doctors to treat a host of invented ailments. But most drank foreign booze, illegally imported into the U.S. by criminal cartels. Canadian whiskey and Mexican tequila served to thirsty patrons at speakeasies across the Southland. What actually remains of Prohibition-era L.A.? Today, the illicit liquor trade is not well documented in the archives. And when you think about it, that's no surprise, given how risky it was. But maybe there's some history to discover out in the city, in the basements and cellars beneath Los Angeles. I'd heard of a secret passageway downtown in the back of the city's oldest saloon. I had to explore it for myself. LA is an idea as much as a city, a landscape of aspirations and imaginations. But behind the idea of LA are the stories of people, dreamers seeking fortune or reinvention, and those who saw the dream as an illusion. So let's uncover clues to a forgotten past in the archives. Lost LA explores the untold history behind the fantasy of California. Lost LA is made possible in part by a grant from Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill philanthropy, the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation, and the California State Library. When Coles opened in 1908 in the basement of the Pacific Electric Red Car Terminal, a staircase connected the bar with the rail platforms up above. Today, the passageway is hidden, but could it have seen use during Prohibition? I met up with Coles owner Sed Moses to see this secret stairway and learn how the city's oldest watering hole survived Prohibition. Welcome. Thank you, I love Coles. I'm not here for a French dip today though. Um, I'm on the hunt for tunnels. But not just any tunnels, I'm looking for uh, bootlegger tunnels. I figured Cole's is one of the oldest restaurants or the oldest restaurant in LA. We are. It's clearly subterranean, so I thought this would be a good place to start. Yeah, well, we do have a secret tunnel that's got some history to it that you most do. people don't know about. This building was built in 1905 yeah. by Henry Huntington as the home for the Pacific Electric Car. So this was so, the headquarters of the fabled red car system. Fabled red car system. An important building then. Yeah. The Pacific Electric car ran a thousand miles throughout Los Angeles County. Over 2,100 cars a day would come through this terminal. Originally, Coles was where you stabled your horses to get on the red car. So there was okay. a tunnel that would go from the horse stables to jump on the Pacific Electric car. Let me show Let's you. take a look, yeah. yeah. So you have to open this up, which is normally locked. I... Oh, oh, wow. So you can see the old wow. stairway that went up into the Pacific Electric car system, which was at the mezzanine level of this building. Then later, Harry Cole opened this restaurant to take advantage of all the foot traffic coming through the station. So this was connection between the rail system and Cole's as I well. See. But let me tell you a little more history, my theories on how this was used at the bar. Go ahead and take a seat. I love this bar. Had yeah. uh, many drinks here <laughs> over yeah, the years. This, this is the original bar, 1908. Been around a long time. It's, you see it's pretty worn in here. Totally, yeah. So. I know a lot about this bar just through a bartender that worked here for 63 years, Jimmy Barella. After he retired, got to ask him questions about Prohibition. And, and when so did forth. he start here? He started here in 1925. So those are the magic years. He worked here during Prohibition. Exactly. He told me, you know, a lot of stories about this place. Also in this building was in the top floor, Huntington yeah. 
built the Jonathan Club here. Yeah. So you know they were drinking up there. It was the, the elite, the Ed Doheny's of the world, Henry Huntington's, the Lankershams, all the rich families that kind of built downtown LA. So the only route in for alcohol during Prohibition was either through the street or through the Pacific Electric car system, which Huntington also ran. And I, see. I speculate that he came through Pacific Electric car through that tunnel. So the tunnel we just saw during Prohibition, that could have actually been used by bootleggers. And yes. people would have smuggled it in on the red car, uh, or Huntington would have, <laughs> would have arranged this. Potentially, <laughs> we're speculating is, yeah. Wow. It was served here. If you were a regular, they would grab a coffee mug for you, just for example. They would fill up your coffee mug full of whiskey for you, and this would come out to your table. <laughs> Instead of coffee, this was your coffee that would be served with your French dip. And how much did you charge for this? About 75 cents. It wasn't yeah. cheap. It wasn't cheap, yeah. but you're getting yeah. illegal hooch. <laughs> right. They still sold near beer, which was 10 cents a, a glass, and then shots of bitters were 35 cents each, which were considered medicinal. That's the only way that they were able to <laughs> That's allow the loophole. <laughs> it makes sense that there would have been alcohol still served here, because this building was the locus of power in Los Angeles, right? Exactly. Pacific Electric basically built modern Southern California. The Jonathan Club, all of the most powerful men in, in, in LA, and they weren't gonna go dry, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. And Cole's yeah. was probably the busiest restaurant in, in town too. Politicians, yeah. gamblers, prize fighters, uh, burlesque dancers, you know, bankers. Yeah, all, all hung out here. This was the place. And of course, the most famous gangster, Mickey Cohen, and yeah. he came through here on, on a regular right. basis. That booth back there was this booth. I see. And he wanted his back against the wall <laughs> so that he wouldn't be shot in the back of the head, of course. And right. anybody that was in that booth, when Mickey Cohen walked in, got out of that booth and cleared out for <laughs> Mickey Cohen. It's a great story. I mean, the history in this bar is amazing. The day Prohibition was repealed, yeah. this, there was a line around the block to get in here. Yeah. They sold 1,900 gallons of beer that day. 1,900 gallons? So wow. people were happy that uh, Prohibition were being repealed. Initially, it was repealed with beer, of course. This has been just so much fun, uh, but I really love to, to go see more tunnels. I mean, we're, we're downtown. Uh, there have to be more. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. This yeah. was the Mecca back in the day during prohibition of, of high finance and illegitimate business. So <laughs> I would definitely go check out King Eddie, which is not more than a block away. Yeah. And they've, they've got a great history, that old bar. Walk along a downtown sidewalk, and you never can be sure what lies hidden beneath your feet. Located on the edge of Skid Row, the King Eddie Saloon has been pouring stiff drinks for more than a century. But during Prohibition, the good times went underground, literally. The seat taken? To explore the bar's hidden past, I met up with Chris Caston, the King Eddie's current owner, Chris, nice and Philip nice Dobard, director of the Museum of the American Cocktail. So I'm on the hunt for uh, Prohibition era tunnels. Mm. Said Moses actually at, at Cole sent me down here. He said I had to check out the King Eddie. Okay, well. I'm at the right place. You are at the right place. Okay, uh, we're one of the oldest bars in downtown Los Angeles. But before that, this was a piano store, and below us, uh, and still, lots of evidence is there today, uh, was a speakeasy. The speakeasy was running all through Prohibition and. Supposedly there was tunnel access from City Hall. Is it still there? The tunnel is still there, the access is walled off. Oh. Yeah. Okay, oh, I'd love to go see it. Let's do it. All right, follow me guys, watch your step. Wow. So is this how people would have gotten downstairs during Prohibition? Uh, yes. All right, this way guys. Wow, this is ah. so cool. Look at these murals. Yeah. Here's one of the largest remaining intact murals. What are these beer mugs? Old tags. Yeah. It, Frosty beer pouring out. Generous pours back during Prohibition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those are supposed to look like big beer barrels. Yes. Did they actually casks. serve out of barrels back or casks? Yes. And so they would set them up like right here? I assume they would be right here. Yeah. Just, 
Open the, wow, amazing. We're out here. I don't know if you can see some of these. Oh yeah. Fantasy yeah. style. Mm -hmm. uh, very Disney inspired. So this was the speakeasy. How many people yeah. fit down here? I assume they didn't have much of a problem with capacity rules. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you could fit, you know, 100, 150, maybe. King Eddie still? Uh, I Probably. think it was known still as the King Eddie speakeasy. Yeah, yeah. So how did people get down here then? So if they didn't come through the tunnel, you probably well, would have had to have a little wink and a nod to the piano shop upstairs. There was a password, right? I assume, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the liquor itself, or the beer, or the, or the Canadian whiskey, how did that get in? That came through the tunnels? If it didn't come through the tunnels, then yeah. it would have uh, been disguised and gone through the sidewalk elevator lifts, um, right. which there's a collapsed one we can take a look at. All right, through here. Wow, it just keeps on going. Yeah. yeah. And then back here is the old ice chest. Ah, oh, wow. All right. Oh, so this was the most important part of the speakeasy. Indeed. If you Indeed. wanted a cold beer, yeah. Massive blocks of ice. Right? Yeah. And then if we go around this way, I can show you the lift to the street, yeah. which is pretty much all collapsed at this point, but still so worth this, checking out. This is going to be Los Angeles Street, right, right Above here. Above us is Los Angeles oh, Street. Oh, really? So, so we're, we're on the sidewalk. sidewalk right now. Oh, wow. Yeah. This and is the lift. You can see the old gears. The, uh, it had a you know one of those cast iron grates that would yeah. open on the sidewalk mm -hmm. and you could load it with whatever. So where's the tunnel? So the tunnel is back that way. Okay. Uh, but also bricked up. Wow. Yeah, have you ever been on Pirates of the Caribbean? It looks like it, right? it smells yeah. a lot like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. It's like that, that musty uh, smell. Yeah, it's a, it, well. Nothing like atmosphere. All right, so. Follow me around this way. Oh, wow. And uh, here's where the old tunnel used to be, the old entrance. Amazing. Can I take a look? Yeah, yeah. please. Oh, wow. Well, there's a lot of stuff in there. So according to the urban lore, this supposedly goes to City Hall. Oh, right. Uh, uh, how cool. Well, they can show me. would yeah. come this way, yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. follow me up. Prohibition, fifth in Los Angeles, which is where we are, right. probably had a little bit of a different character. Is that right? Well, indeed. Yeah. Um, you know, the U.S. had just undergone this tremendous stock market boom, of course, yeah. and there was the stock market crash. Yeah. Um, which, of course, was, was in the midst of Prohibition. Right. But American cities had exploded beginning in the 1890s, and towers were springing up left and right. Yeah. And along with them, tunnel systems connecting much of our downtown's from building to building. Not necessarily for smuggling moves. No, no, just as a matter of infrastructure. Yeah. So, you know, utility tunnels, getting yeah. from one place to another. There were secret passages from courthouses to jails and the like, and city yeah. halls, but uh, uh, once Prohibition arrived, those tunnels were pressed into service as conduits for liquor. How far do these tunnels go? Because you know there, there are these. There's like this urban legend uh, mm. that I've heard that that the tunnels went all the way to the sea, so that that you know smugglers could offload their cargo at like San Pedro or Venice and get it to downtown. Um, yes and no. Again, these these tunnel systems. The fact is, most of those were pre-existing. There were a few that were dug out, yeah. um, but for instance, you would not have found something from downtown Los Angeles extending to the sea. Okay. Um, that's a very long way. <laughs> it really is, But yeah. you might find a, something in Venice or San Pedro that went from a main street to the sea or to a pier. Or so a local could... distribution network. Exactly, yeah. yes. How would the whiskey have gotten from the coast to here, downtown LA, 15 miles away? Various means. Yeah. It might have been buried under bales of hay, you know, legitimate goods. And then bootleggers were a resourceful bunch. Indeed. <laughs> okay. So the tunnel went to City Hall, um, which at the time was run by, well, some pretty corrupt politicians, right? I mean, there was this criminal syndicate mm -hmm. run, run by Charlie Crawford, uh -huh. who essentially was involved in gambling and mm. presumably, you know, rum running. Indeed. Um, that ran the mayor and probably a lot of the police department. Oh, yeah. So yeah. those... Every, everyone was in on the scheme. <laughs> They yeah. made a show of smashing, smashing cases of spirits when they would encounter them to bring something out for the for the cameras, yeah. for the press. But they were in the business along with um, 
you know, the runners. Yeah. So when the speakeasy opened here uh, during Prohibition, you know, what kind of people would come in? I mean, uh, who was the clientele? Prohibition brought about a, a, a change in, in the mix of clientele. Before Prohibition, public drinking was, was almost exclusively the domain of men. With Prohibition, women who had always been drinkers uh, um, um, uh, became part of that clientele, became part of the patron base. It became socially acceptable. Yeah, they could do it behind, behind closed doors, if right, you will. Know. Yeah. Right. So today we take it for granted that you walk into a bar and you'll find men and women. Right. It's Prohibition only to... fostered that culture. Yeah. So before it was just not socially acceptable for women. Exactly. To... Okay. Yeah. Wow. Oh, so we have something to thank for. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Something good. Yeah. Yes. That, that and the rise of organized crime. <laughs> As it turned out, from the very beginning, Prohibition had meant nothing but trouble. It heralded an era of gangsterism that shocked the nation with its blatant violence. Rival gangs fought each other for control of illegal beer and booze. Day after day, newspaper headlines screamed out the news of the bloody gang wars. The law of the land said it was illegal to drink, but very few heeded the law. During Prohibition, two major routes kept L.A. supplied with booze. Some came over land to Los Angeles on the bootleg highway, crossing the Mexican border at Tijuana. But a lot of it came by sea, traveling down the Pacific coast from Canada to Palos Verdes or Venice, where it was offloaded in hidden coves and beneath wooden piers. Could coastal bootlegger tunnels survive to this day? To see what might remain, I visited one of the oldest bars in Venice Beach, the townhouse, and met up with its owner, Louis Ryan. So I just love this place. Uh, you've done an amazing job with this. How long has the townhouse been open? It's been open since uh, 1915. 1915. Yeah, so coming up in the 104th year. We don't know the true anniversary date, so Prohibition date, uh, December 5th, we, we celebrate. So the townhouse never closed. How did it survive Prohibition? Well, I'd like to take the credit, but we've got to give it to Cesar Minotti. Cesar Minotti was an Italian immigrant who uh, bought the land from Abikini himself. Abikini had a vision for the street and for the area, obviously. He wanted this to be sort of a tavern, sort of a place that people could meet and come and have martinis and carveries, and that's what it became. Mm. Hence, uh, Minotti's Buffet. So people would come here and, you know, back then people lived sort of in mid-city and they would frolic here at the beach. This was a very popular place to come. When Prohibition kicked in in 1920 and was enforced then, mm -hmm. they put the bar actually in the basement. Cesar Minotti's a clever guy, he put a grocery store up here uh, to hide, the, you know, the shenanigans below, if you like. Hence all these canned goods Hence, here. exactly. Are these original? Uh, well, they're Some not original from back then, <laughs> but uh, they're what was being sold on grocery shelves at the time, for sure. Auto peas, what are, what are auto peas? God knows. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no idea. And boy, I don't think this brand would be very successful today. W.R. Roach. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> probably not, probably not. The idea is to start the story when people walk in. A lot of people come here, they know about the history, they're yeah. from out of town, and this sort of starts the, the story. So I love that this place remained open during Prohibition, and the cover story was that it was a grocery store. Did the place actually sell groceries, or was it? <laughs> you no, know, I saw an old photo once, black and white. It didn't look like there was a piece of produce out of, out of place. A uh -huh. bunch of Italian guys in starched white aprons. So it was definitely a cover. Right. And the people came in for groceries. I don't think they were buying groceries. <laughs> they were disappearing down into the basement for a, for a cocktail. Now, how would patrons have, have access to Speakeasy? Well, back then, actually, there was no staircases downstairs. There was a secret staircase in the back under two cellar doors, which I'll show you. And there's Cesar Minotti himself over there, who we honor for, uh, for, for opening the place. And he was around during Prohibition. Actually, during Prohibition, we've heard stories from people old enough to know, believe it or not, he was the distributor for all the illegal booze on the west side. Oh, so he was an important man around he here. He was an important <laughs> man around here, yeah, yeah. So the tunnels actually ran from underneath the Abikini Pier, which back then was at the end of Windward, into the basement here. Yeah. So if you had a tavern or a hotel nearby and you needed to stock your cellar anytime between 1920 and 1933, you came to see Caesar Minotti, Caesar was you your got man. your goods, and you left through tunnels and went back to your hotel and stocked your cellar. So I've heard about these tunnels. Can we go take a look? Sure. All right. Let's take a look. Now, I noticed you have the uh, framed picture of Charlie Crawford up on the wall. Yes, yes. The uh, crime boss of Los Angeles yeah, in the 20s. Yeah, yes. And crooked politicians <laughs> and people around back then. Oh, wow. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, so this is the entrance to the tunnel that all the illegal booze came through during Prohibition. 
this was the pipeline to the west side. Doesn't open? <laughs> do, do, doesn't open, unfortunately. Yeah, the city came and poured lots of concrete sometime way before I got here. Uh, but, but during Prohibition, the Canadian whiskey ships mainly would come down from the north. Yeah. And they would park three miles offshore, it's called the rum line, yeah. and send the booze in on smaller boats into the utility tunnels that I described earlier. Yeah. And this was the main pipeline here into Venice. So what was going on down here was a secret. How did people get down here to get the booze? I have an old uh, building and safety permit from 1933 when they put the staircases in. But there was a secret one back here that I'd love to give you a look at. Unofficial staircase? An unofficial staircase, <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. How cool. So this is where the patrons would have come down. Yeah, like back a, in the day when, you know, you might have uh, come from the back alley. Wow, it's yep. solid. I mean, it like is solid. It's redwood solid. plates. Yep, they, yeah. don't, they don't make them like this anymore, you know? Yeah, yeah we, we're really proud of this. We left it in place because we know a lot of people made their way down here during uh, Prohibition. A lot of characters came down these stairs. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. yeah. And it doesn't look like they get regular use anymore, I mean, no, what about a dust on there? <laughs> Definitely not. Yeah, that might be from Prohibition that dust in this room. Absolutely. Prohibition era dust. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be. So there'd be a bouncer up there. You'd know the password. You'd say it. Yeah, they'd... I think there'd be like a grocery store clerk. <laughs> oh, of course, right. And you probably gave a nod or a password and, and you were let down the stairs. I love it. So this was the speakeasy. This is the speakeasy. Yeah. yeah. It still is today. It is indeed. You can feel the history down here. Oh, totally, yeah. You do a great job of preserving it, too. Thank, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, I love it. My favorite spot in the whole place, I gotta be honest, is over here. Oh, wow. I had this cabinet built. We have actually pre-prohibition and prohibition liquor here, sealed. It says bottled in bond, so it was under government supervision. So The federal government. The federal government yeah. were controlling, you know, the liquor at the time. So this is an, actually a, a real prescription prescribed by a doctor. And back then, for whatever your ailments were... Prescription it, for whiskey. Prescription for whiskey. And this is actually a, a real bottle of, of medicinal whiskey right here. Gibson whiskey. Oh, wow. Now, it looks like someone's taking a sip. As you know, yeah. it's known as the angel share. Right. Or evaporated whiskey. <laughs> yes. And it's sealed here, bottled in bond. May I? It's, of course, of it's course. It's nine years old, so right. it's good stuff, No, actually. it's, good, it's yeah. good stuff, yeah. Yeah, and it comes from Brownsville, Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, are, are we brave enough to take a sip? Sure, if you're willing to open that, yeah. On an occasion like this, I've got nine more bottles of Overhold. <laughs> we can open once a year. I think we can afford to open this one. Do you think it's safe? I don't know. Well, let's find out. Let's give it a shot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I'll take a sip first so you don't, you know. <laughs> nobody was harmed during this experiment. <laughs> right. Oh, look, the cork oh, broke. No. Technical it really difficulties. Is old. <laughs> it really is. All right. Well, maybe we have to rethink this, huh? Okay. We'll get a cork opener and open it up. Yeah, let's see what we have. When it was initially sold, it was nine years old, and now it's uh, 100. It's 100 years old. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Let's see if we can get it out. We'll be gentle. Mm, the cork feels very dry. <laughs> well, I mean, th these corks weren't we're, built to last 100 years. We're, we're taking our life in our hands here. <laughs> Let's strain it and get it into a okay. glass, and then we'll take a sip. <laughs> I'm down. All right, all right, give me a second there. Can we sip so it doesn't kill us? This is just some experiment. All right. So, 100-year-old whiskey. 100-year-old. Cheers to Prohibition. It has a nice nose on it. <laughs> to Prohibition. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm surprised. That's no, pretty good. It is yeah. really good. Wow. Yeah, it's smooth. That's really nice. Well, let's wow. Get that, let's get that cork all the way out. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so we know that Prohibition-era medicinal whiskey yes. was good, and it ages pretty well. It ages, so, it ages pretty yeah. well. <laughs> You have quite a collection. When you bought this place, you became a custodian of history. Yeah, yeah, the third owner. I, I think there might have been one in between, maybe unrecorded, but definitely the third owner officially since 1915. This is a true gem, and yeah, I'm honored to be, to be the, the new custodian. You're from Ireland originally? I'm from Ireland yeah. originally, yeah, from, from Dublin, born and raised, yeah. And when you moved out here, did you know that you'd be, uh, you know, own a piece of LA history? Uh, no, I didn't. Yeah, never, never 
thought I'd get my hands on some, such a historic venue. It's lovely to sit in here and see people enjoying. It's still bustling after 104 years. It's easy to imagine that you're back in Prohibition. Absolutely, I think that's the draw. It's a step back in time to an old era of elegance and, and fun, and, and it seems like they're reacting to the room the same way they were 104 years ago, you know? <laughs> well, thank Nathan. you for letting me try that. Absolute wow. pleasure. Yeah, that's it's once an honor. It's lovely to have you here. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you so that. much. Yeah. Mm. It's very good. I'm really surprised is good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's get rid of this cork. <laughs> Some people wonder if L.A. was actually honeycombed with bootlegger tunnels. The more interesting question is, why would it have been? With everyone from the D.A. to the beat cop on the take, bootleggers could afford to be brazen. But no matter what, there will always be something romantic about the notion of underground booze. That nostalgia will sustain the urban legend of LA's bootlegger tunnels for decades to come. In the end, I didn't find exactly what I was looking for. And yet, I did establish one important fact. 100-year-old whiskey tastes pretty damn good. Let's go round with a smile and wait till the clouds roll by. Lost L.A. is made possible in part by a grant from Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropy, the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation, and the California State Library.